Yes. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining with me tonight for Brinkley Boston Church's Wednesday evening Bible study. Missed you last week. I know every time we're off, I say that, but I mean it. Um, had an awesome time being able to visit with my parents last week. Thank you for everybody in house, online, taking that time off last week. Hi, mom and dad. Thanks for joining on Bible study. Um, every week they can, I know they join in, but every once in a while, I love opportunity to go and be in person with them. So we missed a week last week. So we're moving, if you're using the reading plan, we're just moving everything forward a week. Um, I had my administrative assistant change the dates on the reading plan. Not sure if it's on the website yet, but as always, I'll give you by the end of the Bible study um, next week's reading. And as it happens with me quite a bit, especially in a text like the letter of Revelation, uh, I'm behind some. And so you do the reading, but we'll be catching up to you by the time we're done in the last week. 16 week total, 16 total studies. We'll cover about 19 weeks uh, total time, 20 now with the added week that we uh, missed out on. So, I already gave you a clue, but and you're probably already aware, but we're doing Wednesday night adult Bible study, the book of Revelation. Are we living in the end times? And all of you that have been studying with me, the answer to that question, are we living in the end times is what? It's yes. We're in the church age, the age of grace, and we are living in the end times. Hey, before we do anything more, we want to ask the Lord to guide and direct us in our study tonight. Let's do that. Father, we're grateful. Um, we miss those weeks, Lord, of not being together corporately, online, in person. Uh, but Father, we're grateful. We have your word with us each and every day that we're reading it, studying it, hiding it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Guide and direct us in it this evening, Lord. Reveal your truths to us that we would walk in the footsteps of Jesus, your Holy Spirit, to guide us. We pray this in, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. So the homework two weeks ago, I got on my notes here last week. It wouldn't have been last week. It'd been the week before that. Don't get confused by this. This is the screen from two weeks ago. There would be no Bible study last week. And then Revelation 13, 1 through 18. I put April 10th, which is today on there. And I encouraged you to dig on what is the millennium. So let's do some backing up and some remembering, you know, you know, you, Come familiar. I like to do that. I, this this graph I'm pulling up first tonight just to remind you. I should insert here, like Revelations chapter six through eighteen, right above the tribulation portion here. Because remember, that's what we're studying in Revelation six through eighteen from a futurist viewpoint. If you're joining with us new tonight. No, a lot of what I'm going to say is not going to mean a lot to you. You can go back to YouTube, Facebook, and watch our previous videos. That would that would be helpful. You know, I tried hard. I try hard in my you know remembering and going back at repetition every time I do for uh, this to make sense, and I try to make it so if somebody joins new, they're not lost. But when it comes to a text like Revelation, that's just not possible. And remember, we've gone outside the book of Revelation, Daniel chapter 9, Matthew chapter 24, and so we brought in these other texts. Impossible at this point to make it so that if you're new tonight, none of this terminology and stuff would confuse you. So just remind you that we began with the seven seals. Remember the four horses of the apocalypse, the peace treaty, the first horse the on the white horse and the peace treaty. Peace treaty is broken here in the middle by the Antichrist, uh, the Antichrist. And, uh, and then we began into the seven trumpets. I've got the other diagrams up, so I'm not going to spend all my time going over this one, but... Um, <clears throat> The seven year tribulation, three and a half years, three and a, and then the, the middle portion and the 
second three and a half years. So I've found, I think I've actually had this a while, but I've found another diagram that I, when I say repetition and keep going back, I like to do it with the whole biblical history and the biblical text. And this says the big picture. I actually think this is the small picture. There's a lot of biblical history missing here. But the point with this diagram is to see what we've been doing in end time study. So this one begins with creation, the fall of mankind, formation of Israel, Jesus' birth. I won't uh, read everything here, but Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection. Israel reborn, 1946. <clears throat> we went over that the night we discussed the history of Israel as it relates to end times study. This diagram has a uh, you are here and puts it just before the rapture of the church. I'll talk about it later. The eclipse the other day, there was a lot to talk about end time stuff. And you heard a lot about the rapture. We've been hearing a lot about that more. You can see here we're in the church age. Um, and then we have the seven-year tribulation. Remember, I mentioned Daniel chapter nine. We, we've gone back to that. Um, this diagram has the return of Christ following the tribulation. And then the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ, the millennium, um, thousand-year reign of Christ, Revelation chapter 20, the great white from judgment, and then eternity. So anyway, uh, in-house, I printed this off for them so they'll get a copy of this. You guys online can come back and, and uh, look at it. But I thought it the, the author did an awesome job of bringing in, uh, uh, simply putting what we've actually been doing. And remember, in our re uh, Revelation text, we're talking about, and by the time we're done with Revelation, this small portion of this biblical history Timeline. So let's continue on back to diagrams I've shown you before. A little repetition here. Revelation chapter one, our introduction. Revelation chapter two and three, the address to the seven churches. Some of my favorite portion of scripture in Revelation. Not full of all that symbolism. I love symbolism. But as you already know in your journey with me, that gets it gets and tonight we're really going to really begin to dig on some symbolism that's that's really difficult to dig on. Revelation chapter 4 begins the future um, events that we see in the book of Revelation. We have the six seals uh, that begin in Revelation chapter 6. Remember I said the first four were the horses of the apocalypse. We uh, talked about the abomination of desolation the rapture seven-year period of time, the halfway point, that's where that takes place. We talked about the 144,000 and uh, the great multitude in white robes. We opened the seventh seal that opened the seven trumpets. We, we have not gone into detail in every one of the seals and every one of the trumpets. That would be a much bigger study. Hard to believe that we're like, in the 13th week of a 16-week study, um, it, we'll, we're going to go out beyond that. But um, And it just goes to show you how much study is here and the intensity needed to really dig in God's work on apocalyptic literature. And that's what I said to you. Even after this many weeks, we will not cover every issue. So the uh, if you look at this diagram, you can relate it to that first one. Here's the first three and a half years of the tribulation. The second three and a half years of the tribulation, the seven trumpets fall into that period of time. I highlighted here because there's this interlude or this period of time in between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. And last Bible study, I introduced this diagram. That's the last one, but expands that uh, highlighted portion there a moment ago. And the chapters um, that are covered between the sixth and the seventh um, trumpet. The seventh trumpet actually comes in in Re Revelation chapter 7. So that's actually what we're going to begin to tackle this evening. By the way, 
the seventh the seventh trumpet begins the the three the third woe. I brought up woes to you before. I want to kind of return. I want to return to that and go over that a little bit. Um, but uh, oh, here I got ahead of myself <laughs> a uh, a little bit. And I, I wanted to mention here, so uh, when we get to the seventh trumpet, we're going to be headed fast towards chapter 16 and the seven bowls in chapter, the beginning of chapter 11, we talked about the time of the Gentiles, the two witnesses, we discussed who they are. Um, some people think they're only symbolic, some two unknown people. Uh, a lot of people, Enoch and Elijah, and a lot of people, Moses and Elijah, won't rehash all of that again. So I mentioned to you a moment ago, I've got it highlighted here, that in Revelation chapter 11, we now are at the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is going to sound. So if I didn't tell you already, uh, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11 and go to verse 15. We're picking up chapter in about the middle. And let me read for you just that one verse so you can see where we are. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, and you can read um, that. But remember I mentioned a moment ago that the seventh trumpet is the third Whoa. So look at verse 14, 11, 14. You're, you're probably, if, if you're not familiar with the woes, then you're wondering where I'm getting this from. Look at verse 14, just before that. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. So um, woe means grief or anguish or suffering, uh, affliction. So these are Extra special. So we've got uh, we've got grief and suffering happening within the text, but these woes are special periods of suffering. They started with the fifth trumpet. That's probably when I first mentioned it to you. If you go back to chapter, actually chapter nine, but look at chapter eight, verse thirteen. I'll give you a minute, a second to do that. So. Chapter nine, we're going to pick up the first woe, but in chapter 13 or chapter eight, verse 13, listen as I read it to you. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So now we know that each of these next trumpet blasts, they are woes. Chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given to the shaft of the abyss. So the first woe begins, and then jump over to verse 12 of same chapter, chapter 9, verse 12. The first woe is past, Two other woes are yet to come. So the fifth trumpet is a woe, um, not just a judgment from God, but a woe. And then the sixth trumpet begins the second woe. And then I already, I already read to you 1114 uh, over in chapter 11. Then we get the seventh trumpet and the third woe. You can do some deeper digging on the woes if you want to. And once again, we're not going into detail. I want to get into more detail in chapter 12 um, as the seventh trumpet sounds, but uh, we're not going to get into detail into every one uh, of these um, trumpets. And, and so we're not, we're not going to do that. But notice the change in tone now. So we get the seventh trumpet. I want to continue reading a little bit. We're going to have a these are judgments of God, right? So you be, might be surprised about the, the tone change that happens here. Uh, uh, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, verse 15, chapter 11, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. 
and the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. I'm going to read down through uh, verse verse 9, the, ver, uh, 19, verse 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. You know, when I read that verse, studying for tonight, I thought, would we say that about today, that the nations are angry, like in rebellion against God? Uh, there's a lot of angry nations <laughs> in the world, not just ours, right? And your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. So why the change in tone? I mean, there's a positive beginning to this whole thing, and it's simply this, I think. So it's the beginning of the end. You know, we're in the second half of the tribulation here, um, and the beginning of the end is coming, and we should, it's it's an awesome thing. It's it's an exciting thing. It, it, the, the, the reality of the answer to the question, why is there so much suffering in the world and bad and hurt and pain? And when is God going to do something about it? Here it's happening. It's taking place. So the Lord has come and he's in control. The woe is there's still more suffering and bad and difficult and anguish and affliction yet to take place. So the two things are happening uh, at, at once there. So now I wanted to, I, I actually meant to leave that last diagram up, but I, I like to bring them down when I can. And just simply, so what happens now before we get to the first bowl? So Revelation 10, I, I mentioned this two weeks ago, the announcement of God's accomplishment of God's plan. So we're getting this positive. The end is, is now taking place. Judgment is going to happen. And God's going to set all things right. Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses we talked about. Um, so the sounding of the seventh trumpet. That's where we're picking up and beginning tonight. Revelation 12 is where we're going to spend most of our time. Conflict between Israel and Satan during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Roles of Antichrist, false prophets during the last three and a half years. By the way, this conflict between Israel and Satan is a statement of interpretation by author of the diagram. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Revelation 14, announcement and warning regarding salvation. Celebration of chapter 15, an appearance of seven angels with seven bowls. And then we're going to start that last part of the journey of the seals, trumpets, and bowls with, uh, the, uh, with the bowls. Now, Chapter 12. Let, let's let's go to chapter 12. So now I've mentioned seven uh, seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, three woes, two witnesses, all these other things. I don't want to bring confusion, but now we're going to begin a very, there's a very short uh, section of Revelation here where we get what most point out as biblical scholars, seven signs. I don't have a diagram for you. I'm not going to diagram it. I don't want to insert it um, to create further confusion. But in this uh, uh, text that we're tackling tonight, chapter, uh, let me see here. I've got it all marked and highlighted. Uh, 12, 13, and I think all the way to 15, yeah, in that short section, we get seven signs. Um, if you look at 12.1, now we're going we're gonna to hang out here quite a bit, but I want to talk about the signs first. 12.1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. So this word sign, it's not used seven times, 
But it is, it's in here repetitively. Look at verse three. Then another sign. Um, where else did I see? Because I, I highlighted all the way over to chapter 15. I saw verse one. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. So if you're wondering where I get this from, that the repetition of that word. If you dig deeper, you're going to find different opinions, slightly, not significantly, on what constitutes those seven signs, because not every verse uh, uses that word to signify that it is. This one, I compared to a couple of others, and there was really only one difference between them. But here's, I just created a list of the seven signs that I see between chapter 12, chapter 15. The woman representing Israel, that's what we're reading in 12.1. The dragon representing Satan. By the way, I put in here and left in here, interpretations of the symbolism. We're going to get to some of that tonight. So I just want you to know, not everybody interprets the woman as representing Israel. Um, and actually, I've let that out of the bag here, because with the in-house, I'm probably going to pause here and ask, what do you think these represent, um, these symbols represent in this text, before I actually get to this? Um, so... But online here, we're just going to have to live with what a, a spoiler, if you will. Uh, the man-child, referring to Jesus in 12.5, is a sign. The angel Michael, head of the angelic host, 12.7. The offspring of the woman, representing Gentiles who come to faith in the tribulation. Now, what's the difference between that and the man-child? If you look at verse 17, it's interesting what it says here. Verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast testimony about Jesus. So we get this a further description of offspring that the woman has. Um, and the, the interpretation here is Gentiles. The beast out of the sea representing the Antichrist, 13.1. The beast out of the earth representing the false prophet that promotes the uh, Antichrist. And you know what? I left one out of here accidentally. I can fix that for, uh, for my in-house. 15.1 um, should have been... There, the the uh, seven angels, um, and actually that's the one where it's different on another uh, on a on some other commentary that I read. That one wasn't actually included, so it's it just depends on what you think. The point is that the word is used, and these are signs that are given. Remember, we don't know the day or the hour, but we will see the signs um, of the times. Uh, and so let's dig now. Let's let's go to the text, uh, chapter 12, and let me, I want to read 1 through 6, and then we'll stop there and begin to dig a little deeper. 12.1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Remember, it's just a thought. We're still in the tribulation period, the second half, three and a half years. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, listen to this, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled in the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. There we got another number. I'm not ready to dig on this evening, but I read that and it's sounding a lot like the birth, the crucifixion of you know who, right? And so, and and it it just seems a very similar in some ways. 
to that. But let's dig on the symbolism. I did find an artist's rendering of this moment. But that's hard to find sometimes. And some of them aren't very good. But anyway, the text of what we just read, you might be wondering. I'm not going to go back and read it again. Maybe I should have had this up there while, while I read it. But um, if you look at verse 14, like, why does she have wings? When you read these first six verses, you don't get that. But over in verse 14, it says, the woman was given two wings of the two wings of a great eagle. So she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. So this artist rendering does have most as she's standing on a portion of the moon, I believe it is. Isn't that what the text said? Um, yeah, to a uh, moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars over there in one through six. Um, and then it even talks about the uh, the serpent spewing out water like a river. So this uh, uh, artist rendering, I thought, uh, did a pretty good job of trying to get all the elements um, and near, nearly impossible to, you know, it's one of those things where the vision that John saw was a godly vision. We can't really put it into human terms. So when I say deeper digging, remember, we've got our symbolism. What does it represent? Because that's a huge part of the interpretation of end times literature, apocalyptic literature. So when it comes to this woman that's pregnant, um, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out. Um, the main theories, if you will, I don't like that word, but the main theories about who this woman is, is number one, the church and the stars would represent the 12 apostles. And one of the things those people who think she just, she represents the church is um, that in Revelation, women represent religious ideas or religious systems, if you will, in the book of Revelation. And I took a couple of texts. There's at least one other that they would use and say, first of all, chapter 2, verse 20, nevertheless, it's the address for the churches. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by her teaching. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality. Of course, most scholars agree that. And don't we, we used to anyway, right? That person is a Jezebel, right? So most believe that this is a um, symbolic use of a name to represent sin and wickedness. Um, in a general sense. And then in chapter 19, verse 7, you've probably heard the church referred to as the bride. I meant to bring that up later. But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me. Um, oh, didn't mean to do that. I meant this text. Let us rejoice, chapter 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready, the church. And so uh, they they use the fact that that kind of symbolism is used in Revelation to say that this woman in chapter 12 is the church. Some, I think the Catholic Church does. Some people believe that this is Mary. I mean, it, it appears like the baby, the man-child, would be Jesus, so this should be Mary. Probably the most popular, I, I was comparing commentaries of Protestant scholars and doing my own study here as well, and it seemed like uh, back and forth between whether this represented the church or it represents Israel. I, I think it fell to the side of many scholars believe that this woman represents Israel. 
And you might be, so how is that? How would this woman represent Israel? And I've got a couple of texts for you here that I nearly got ahead of myself on. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 9, this story of Joseph, one of my favorite stories of the Bible. Remember Joseph? Um, uh, uh, Joseph, he's the dreamer, right? He ends up with his brothers wanting to kill him. He ends up in Egypt, that whole incredible story. Um, and this is where we begin to get the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, their father, um, and we get the, the, the 12 tribes. At this point, um, Joseph is having those dreams, and the stars represent his brothers. He's going to end up in the lineage of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's not actually Joseph. Um, but his sons, but all that aside, these 11 stars are his brothers, the 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon, his mother and father, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. That's eventually going to happen in Egypt after Joseph ends up there. But the uh, 12 tribes here, the 11 brothers, are represented as stars all the way back in Genesis 37, verse 9. So we're thinking about the 12 stars in the top of the woman's crown on her head. I think, yeah, it says, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon on her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. So they would believe, uh, uh, if you believe that she represents Israel, then the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And they um, also point out that Israel, Israel is referred to in multiple places in the scripture, in the feminine, if you will, as a woman, but like a woman unfaithful to her husband. So you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. So all of that, putting that together, um, many scholars believe that this woman is the nation Israel. The uh, male, and like I said, many believe that it's also the church. And Jesus comes out of, Jesus is the church, the head of the church. And of course, Jesus came out of Israel, God's chosen people. So there's that connection um, as well. So then, who's the child? Look, uh, at, look at verse 5. I read this for you. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And so when you, when you read and you study and you dig and you look at this, it becomes there's very few that stray from this is obviously a symbol of Jesus, um, of, of Christ. Um, there's a few others, but by and large, um, it, it really is that. Um, and then uh, the dragon. So, uh, you know, who is the dragon? Look at verse 9, 7, 8, 9. The great dragon was hurled down. And you got to love it when the text tells you the answer, right? Uh, and verse nine, the great dragon was hurled down. The ancient, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So um, it becomes clear and evident right in the text that when we're talking about the dragon, we're talking about Satan. Um, now, we could go into further detail. That's what I said. There's a lot of detail here, and we could, um, there's a lot to this, um, and I encourage you to do the further study. But I wanted to point out here that now we're getting into, we're, we're in events that are taking place, and not that we haven't already, but it becomes really clear here, that are taking place on earth, but in heaven also, because look what happens next. Uh, a war breaks out, beginning in verse 7. Then war broke out, but this war is in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Actually, I think I have an image here that I'll share with you. Yeah, not a very good one, I think, as far as what we can actually tell. But um, when we read what's going to happen, I assume the dragon and his followers and angels are down here on the earth. Uh, verse 9 that I already read to you, the great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So now we get this heavenly battle. Uh, events are taking place on the earth. The tribulation. The abomination of desolation, um, breaking of the peace treaty with Israel, the judgments of God, the trumpets, but we've got this war uh, taking place uh, in in heaven. And so now I was going to unpack, you know, 13, 14, 15 real quick so we could begin to get to the bowls. And we're going to try to include that next week so that we can keep building bridges to what events take place next. Um, so we will we'll try to do that. But because of time's sake, I want to real quick switch gears and go to, I, I told you to uh, study the millennium, see what you could find out on your own uh, about that. So let's go there for a moment. First of all, a definition. I gave you a glossary of terms at the beginning of our lessons. The millennium from Latin meaning a thousand. So we're going to see in the text a thousand years. Christ reign on earth described in Revelation 20, 4 through 6. Now you can turn there, but I put it on the screen for you. See if I can get me out of the way and read it for you. This is the text where the idea of the end times event of the millennial reign of Christ the millennium is found in the biblical text. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. And I got to pause there. Made me think of movies back in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, some of you, if you're in my age group, you might have seen them. A Thief in the Night, that was 72. A Distant Thunder, 78. Image of the Beast, 1981. Um, in one of those movies, maybe multiple ones, but in one of those movies, there were people actually being beheaded during the tribulation. They were for young people. They're pretty scary movies. Right. It's kind of the old left behind movie type of movies. And uh, some pretty frightening uh, stuff in those movies back then. And, and of course, closely de uh, depicting the events that we read about here. They, uh, they had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And so the reference to the thousand year reign of Christ is where we get the whole idea of the millennium. Now. Remember, I told you that um, there's different uh, beliefs about how the end times unfold. And this is just, you've probably heard or referred to yourself or someone else or asked, are you a pre-millennialist? Um, and what's actually being referred to there is this, pre-millennialists believe that, a, that the millennium is a future event and that Christ will return before Three, the millennium. A millennialists treat the millennium as a symbol of Christ's present reign among his people. Post millennialists believe that Christ will return after post the millennium. So, pretty simple concept. We hear those terms, probably confusing. I told you that the most common view today 
is dispensational premillennialism. Uh, and so the most widely accepted view is that Christ will return before the millennium. So I brought these back just for you to see again. And, and these things, if they didn't make sense to you before, maybe they already did. It will really start to make sense now. So this is historic premillennialism. Um, and so you've got the second coming of Christ before the millennium. Same with the dispensational premillennial premillennialism, which I told you is the most common view today. Um, you've got the second coming of Christ and then the millennium. And what was mentioned a moment ago, amillennialists, it's happening. Uh, you know, it's happening right now. And the second coming of Christ, it, it almost looks like post-millennialism. Because that clearly shows that at the end is the return of Christ. Now, I told you we've been studying the book of Revelation from a dispensational premillennial uh, view. It's most common. Um, a, a lot of the more contemporary studies on Revelation um, have been done uh, as premillennialist. And then I joke saying that I'm a panmillennialist. And I'm somewhat serious about that. And what I mean is, I said it earlier, that the smartest scholar on this is going to be wrong about some things. A human scholar, because the only one we know who knows all the detail for absolutely certain is God the Father about these events that will take place. So that brings in final thought for you as we land this plane tonight. There's a verse that caught my attention a little bit farther ahead in the text, chapter 13, verse 10. It just kind of sits there in the middle of the text, and I wanted to show it to you. It's pretty profound. Let me, there we go. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. So remember, we're in the second half of the tribulation. And if you're premillennialist, the, well, the rapture has already taken place. So these would be people during the rapture that have come to Christ. But I, I just want to say that either way, even now, because we live in the end times, right? This is pretty profound and powerful. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And I believe what you're experiencing, what I'm experiencing right now in these last days, um, no matter what events, the apocalypse or the eclipse the other day, man, there's been a lot of talk about the apocalypse, the end times, you know, a lot of people talking about, and everybody's talking about the next event is the rapture. Whatever next event comes this text, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness, part of God's people, is real and alive, and I think should be an encouragement for us today. And then remember, I've been saying this a lot. When is Jesus coming back? He's coming back now. We don't know the day, the hour, right? So are we living in end times? Yes. When is he coming back? He's coming back now. You live like it's today. And you also live like not yet. We're supposed to be serving and ministering. And living for Jesus and sharing the gospel and the good news with others and caring for our families and sharing it with them and passing it on to the next generation. And the most important point in all of this, according to Jesus, was to be ready. Okay? And that is a personal relationship with your heavenly father through his son, Jesus. Homework next week, Revelation 14, 1 through 10. And dig on Armageddon, chapter 16, verse 16. If I don't see you before, I'll see you next week. But let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you know the plans you have for us. <laughs> They're not to harm us because you're a good God. You're being patient, not wanting anyone to perish. So, Father, we read about some of the events and there's tremors of fear. The Father, like those 24 elders who fall in worship, we worship you. We're in awe 
at the coming of the last days and that this whole thing in our complaining and our questioning, why is there so much sin and brokenness, sickness and death and disease in the world and it will be brought to an end. We long for it, we look forward to it, but we're grateful in the meantime. And we live like the imminent return of Jesus, the rapture, the imminent, your work in the end times is any moment. And so we are ready through your son, Jesus, and we want to serve you, Father, because you're being patient and pass on the gospel to those around us, to the next generation. Help us to do that, your peace and presence in each and every home. I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless. Thank you for watching tonight. Have a God week.